so as you um, as you saw on the um, on the announcement, um, I want to look at the. There, there's lots of encampments. We saw that uh, John really started us off. Uh, uh, John Billisall and he took up the first two, and I think I've maybe taken two or three sessions on the encampments, and I want to take up the tenth one. Um, this this time um so turn with me first to uh numbers 33 where we pick up on that um numbers 33 i was debating whether to look at the 11th verse 12th and 13th verses where you have three encampments one of them has to do with the manna and i elected not to that's maybe a subject for another time. It's, it's a rather large one. Um, but we have in verse uh, 12, there's Dafka. And then in verse 13, there's Alush. But I'd like to look at what we have in, um, in verse 14. It says, they removed from Alush and encamped in Rephidim, where there was no water for the people to drink. And then they departed from uh, Rephidim, Rephidim and pitched in the wilderness of Sinai. So we're going to pick up now on, uh, if we go to um, Exodus uh, 17, which is where that encampment is. And um, what transpires in this, this chapter is the uh, warfare against Amalek. And as I've considered this, this uh, encampment, I thought maybe it would be helpful um, to, to go through the subject and the history of Amalek. Um, let, let me ask this. Has anybody ever heard uh, an address on Amalek? It's not something you're going to read in a book, typically. It's just my own meditation that I've had from some time ago. Um, I don't see lots of hands waving. Um, so just to, to refresh us, the, the concept of Amalek is he's a picture of the flesh. Now, there's the, the flesh comes in many, many, um, um, many ways. There's immoral flesh, there's religious flesh, and it's actually anything that's in opposition to the working of the Spirit of God in our lives. The difference, we, you know, we have three main enemies. One is uh, the enemy, Satan. One of them is the world. And the third one is the flesh. The difference between the flesh and the other two is it's the enemy working from within. The Satan works from without. The world works from without. But the flesh is, is that which is within. And the flesh is, is not something that, um, that there's any forgiveness for. Our sins are forgiven, but the flesh is condemned and needs to be put in the place of death. And we take that up in, you take that up in the book of Romans. Um, it touches on it in, in Galatians, which we might look at. But with regards to Amalek, there are six events in the word of God with regards to Amalek. And I'd like to look at them, those, those six events. And the, the, the way we start off uh, is in this book, in, in, in Exodus 17, which is that 10th encampment. Notice, uh, if you have your Bibles there, we'll, we'll pick up here on the first verse. It says, all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys, according to the commandment of the Lord, and pitched in Rephidim. Now, that's what we read in uh, Numbers 33. And here we find what transpires. It says, there was no water for the people to drink. So what's the reaction? The reaction to the people of God is not crying to God, which is often my reaction. It's complaining. And so we have here, it says, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? 
Wherefore do you, here's the second thing. First of all, they chide with Moses and then they tempt the Lord. And then it says, and the people thirsted there for water. The people murmured against Moses. The third thing. They're chiding first. They're tempting the Lord. They're murmuring against Moses. And then they say in the end of that third verse, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of the Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And what happens? We find that uh, Moses cries to the Lord. Well, um, this is the place where the Lord said unto Moses, go on before the, the people and take with thee the elders of Israel and thy rod where thou smotest the river Take in thine hand and go, and behold, I will stand before thee there in the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And people did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? What a statement. Just, just, just think of the Lord receiving a statement like that. After all that he's done. And yet I think when the flesh works within me, those things are all manifest. And so we're going we're gonna to look now, because what this does is it puts the people of God in a position where Amalek can now come in. And that's what happens in the very next verse. So we read verse 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. It's going to be, um, it, it's been very instructed, uh, instructive for me just to see uh, the characteristics of Amalek as we go through these various events. There's a number of them. There's, there's just to, just to, to alert you as to what's happening. There's, there's this one in Exodus um, 17. There's one in 1 Samuel 15. There's one in, um, in 1 Samuel 30. There's one in 2 Samuel, the first chapter. And there's uh, one in 1 Chronicles 4. And then there's one in the book of Esther. All those are events where Amalek raises his head and uh, here it is in the, in the 17th of Exodus, we find a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus interceding for us on high. And we see it with Moses um, and his hands and those that, um, that are on either side of Moses uh, holding up the hands. Um, often we hear that Moses' hands came down. That's not the way it reads. We only read that one of Moses' hands came down. And the, the difference is that one hand speaks of the high priestly service of the Lord, and the other speaks of his advocacy. And um, that's a good thing to keep in mind um, in our own relationship with the Lord and his intercession for us. So I'm just going to read this now and then, go, and then go ahead to look at the characteristics of Amalek. So we find here, uh, verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel and Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him. And fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. When he let down his hand, isn't that interesting? It's only one hand. And I believe it's the Hur hand. I not say that, but Aaron would speak of the high priestly service of the Lord, whereas um, uh, Hur would speak of the Lord's advocacy when there's failure on our part. I don't want to develop that. I want to try to stick with the subject. That's, uh, but those, I just tuck that in for your own meditation. But it says here, came to pass when Moses, in, in that 11th verse, when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy. They took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua dis 
come fitted Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said to Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly destroy, destroy, uh, put out of the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. And he said, because the Lord hath sworn that, this is very, very instructive for us. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So who, who among us have not struggled with the flesh in some point, in some time? I might even add, in some day. Um, it's always there, and it needs to be put in the place of death. But it's beautiful. I'm not going to turn to these uh, scriptures because there's too many to turn to during this time. But just the, the picture that it is of the Lord's um, intercession for us, if you're to turn to, to Romans 8, and in the 26th verse, it says, the spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. The 27th verse we read, he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Uh, the 34th verse, Christ, who is at the right hand of God, who maketh intercession for us. And then in Hebrews 7 and 25, we read, he ever liveth to make intercession for us. Oh, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful comfort to realize that there's one on high on our behalf at all times. Just beautiful. And, and as you see, you see this picture of Moses there with his hands up. It's a picture of how the Lord is always there on our behalf. What a comfort it is to realize. Well, what is it that the what was it that worked with Amalek that they came here and they fought with Israel? You know, we read those earlier verses where uh, the children of Israel really put themselves in a state where they tempted the Lord, they chided with Moses, they murmured, they, they complained, they fussed and whined, and they just put them in a bad, bad state. And that's when Amalek comes in and does his work. Now, to get, we don't find it here, but Moses elaborates on that in Deuteronomy 25. So let's turn to there. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 25, where he's going to elaborate on what exactly happened here in the 17th of Exodus. So Numbers 25. And um, this is a, a chapter that takes up a number of things. Um, you don't muzzle the ox when he's treading out the corn. Um, speaks of, uh, of a brother here. It speaks of... Um, of uh, Divers weights in the 13th verse, uh, great and small, and uh, the, the need to have weights that are, that are correct. You pick that up in Leviticus as well. But now in verse 17, we read, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee by the way, and he smote the hindmost of thee. He smote the hindmost. He smote those that were getting tired. Notice what it says here. He smote the hindmost, even all that were feeble. When thou wast faint and weary. Anybody ever here ever felt feeble? Ever felt weary? Ever felt faint? You know, that puts us in a position where, the, where Amalek comes in and he does his work. Because what happened with the, with the people of God was they had put themselves in that position by their fussing and their whining and their murmuring and their complaining. And there were some that were lagging behind. They were lagging behind. You remember when we, remember when we um, were looking at, uh, at the, uh, Peter's steps to his denial? Remember one of them was he followed afar off. He lagged behind. And that's what we find here with the people of God. They started to lag behind there. There were, there were those that were at the back. You know, it's, the, what, it's what the wolves do with bison. It's what they do with caribou. It's what they do with deer. They, they go after the weak ones, the ones that are weary at the end. And that's exactly what Amalek does. And that's when the flesh in our own lives rears its ugly head. 
And so he says here, just remember what Amalek did unto you and the condition that you were in when he was able to operate. It's an interesting statement, the hindmost. There's a number of times in the, in, in the word that we read of, of the hindmost. We won't look at those. Um, but let's turn over now to, to Isaiah. Um, Isaiah, the 40th chapter, to a very, very well-known uh, scripture that's been a comfort to so many of us some uh, at many times but it's particularly helpful now to, to look at this in connection with Amalek and so it's Isaiah chapter 40 very well known verses we, we know them we know them off by heart but just see them now fitting in to this subject uh, verse 28 hast thou not known hast thou heard the everlasting God, the Lord, creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He gives power to the faint. To them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. The young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now, Probably most of us here have not <clears throat> taken this scripture <clears throat> and tied it to what was happening there in the 17th of Exodus, where the people were lagging behind, where they were weary, where they were feeble. And why? It was because of their state of soul. They fussed and whined and complained. They chided with Moses. They murmured against the Lord. They tempted the Lord, and it put them in a position for Amalek to be able to come in and do his deadly work to those that were lagging behind. Now, what could they have done then? Uh, we got the answer right here. They that wait upon the Lord. We don't read them crying to the Lord when there was no water. That's not what we read. It's Moses did that. But the people, they were just tired. <sighs> that happens with me, you know, and I, I see the signs. And having taken up this subject, uh, I, I realize what's happening. And it's good for us, isn't it, to, 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 to see the condition that we get into and to realize that uh, there needs to be a waiting on the Lord and a crying to the Lord instead of complaining like the people of God did. Well, in order to get through these, these six, we're going to have to move on. So let's, let's move on now to 1 Samuel, the 15th chapter. 1 Samuel, chapter 15 where we find the, the next event with, um, with, with regards to Amalek. And it's, 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 it's in the life of Saul. For Samuel 15, uh, the first verse, Samuel says unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee, the king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken unto, un, thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, of hosts, I remember what Amalek did to Israel. Here's another expression now, because we don't read this expression in Exodus and we don't read of it in Deuteronomy, but it's what Amalek was doing. It says he laid wait for him in the way. Fascinating. Um, um, fascinating uh, statement there in connection with Amalek. He's just ready to pounce on those that are weary and feeble and just ready to give up. That's where he is. So the enemy of our souls, he knows, he knows what's happening. Um, you know, um, and if you go on now, Saul does the same thing. It says, Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in, in, in um, to lay them 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Israel. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and he laid wait in the valley. That's a, that's a, it's a, it's a statement that we, that we read of a number of times. You, you, you read of it with, um, you remember when um, uh, Samson was there with Delilah and she was cutting his hair off. We read that statement that there were those that were laying wait. They were just waiting for him. Um, 
you, you, you remember when, when the Apostle Paul was let over the wall in a basket, the reason was there, there were those, and it uses this statement, they were laying wait for him. They were just ready to pounce on him. It's a, it's a number of times um, in, in, in the word. It's so instructive. Well, um, what happens here is, and this is, this is a turning point in Saul's life. There's been some, some really bright spots in Saul's life, and this is not one of them. And this is a turning point. And this instruction is given, and Saul said unto the Kenites, go and depart, uh, the, the eighth verse, and get you down from among Am the Amalekites, lest I destroy you. And it says, um, in verse 7, and, and Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, which is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them and everything that was vile and refuse they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel saying, it repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king for he is turned back from following me. You know, I think that's the, that's the turning point in Saul's life. And we have that so often in the word, a turning back. We read of it in the 78th Psalm. It says the men of Israel being armed and with bows. It says they turn back in the day of battle. Remember Lot's wife, as they're fleeing, what does she do? She turns around and she looks back. We find it in Jeremiah um, there, uh, Jeremiah 33, the Lord says about Israel, they have turned to me the back. Well, well, what a statement for the Lord to look at his people Israel and say, they have turned to me the back. Uh, such a solemn thing. We, we have in the, in the Gospels, the Lord in the ninth of Luke, he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and turning back is fit for the kingdom of God. Exactly what Saul does here, and it's in relation to Amalek. Well, let's go on. Samuel addresses Saul, the 14th verse. What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of oxen, which I hear? And Saul said, oh, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord Notice this, thy God, not my God, but thy God, a real turning away. Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I'll tell thee what the Lord hath said this night. He said, say on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own eyes, thine own sight. Oh, that's a good thing for us. That's a very good thing for all of us to be little in our own sight. There's such a tendency for us to think of ourselves a little bit more than what we are. And that's what Saul did. Well, it says, the Lord sent thee on a journey. He said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord? And the 20th verse, Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. And have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil. And notice again at the end of this verse. So the people took of the spoil, the sheep and the oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord. Again, it's thy God. It's not my God. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. You know, a concept that is good for us to get a hold of is this. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. If I'm obedient in an, in an area, in an item, 95% of that item. 
It's called disobedience. It's not something that Saul had got a hold of. So in verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned and I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. That is a statement that Saul says, I believe, three times, but he never says it to the Lord. He says it to Samuel and he says it to David, but he never said it to the Lord. He never said it. I have sinned to the Lord. So Samuel says in verse 26, I will not return with thee for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected thee from being king over Israel. Samuel turned about to go away and laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and rent it. And Samuel said unto him, the Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thee. And we find again in the 30th verse, Saul says, I have sinned. But again, he says it to Samuel. He doesn't say it to the Lord. So we find now Samuel deals with it in verse 32. Then said Samuel, bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came delicately. And Agag said, surely uh, the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, as thy sword hath, hath, um, hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And, and Samuel doesn't say that he killed Agag. It said he hewed him in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. It's, it's a, it's a, it, to me, it's a tremendous example of what we need to do with the flesh. There's nothing good about it. Nothing. You can dress it up. You can make it look pretty, but it's still the flesh. And the flesh has a clean side and a dirty side. And we've, we have a tendency to look at the clean side and say, oh, it's not that bad. It's horrific. Every time it raises its, its head in our lives. And it needs to be placed in the place of death. That's where it needs to be placed. Every time it raises its head. Such a solemn thing to look at. We're, let's go on. I see we're marching along here. Let's go to, um, let's go to uh, 1 Samuel and the 30th chapter. Look at the next event with regards to Amalek. 1 Samuel 30, this takes place in, in David's life. It's a hard time for David. Um, in, in, in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, the first verse, it says, It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captives that were therein, they slew not any. That's a, that, that's an interesting statement because if you look through at the various times Amalek is mentioned, their work was not to slaughter the people of God. Th their work was to take all the food. That's what they did. You remember in, um, in Gideon's day, it says they came and they took all the sustenance in Israel. They took the crops. They took the animals. They took everything that there was to eat. And that's exactly what the flesh does in our own lives, is when we feed the flesh, it takes away our appetite for that which is real that which our spiritual lives need. And, and this should be a warning to us. As soon as we lack appetite in our lives for the word, it should be, it, it sh really should be a warning that, oh, Amalek has stuck his head up again and needs to be placed in the, in the place of death. Well, here, what ha let, let's, let's read what happens. Um. They carried to the end of the second verse, they carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city. Behold, it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters were taken captive. David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to, to, to weep. The end of the sixth verse, it says, but David here, they're, they're talking about stoning him. But David encourages himself in the Lord is God. 
And he says to Abiathar, bring me hither the ephod. Seventh verse, Abiathar brings the ephod. And the Lord inquires, and David inquires of the Lord, saying, shall I pursue? Oh, how different this is from when the people of God came and they found no water. Instead of fussing and whining and, and complaining and being bitter towards the Lord, David says, she, he, he, he inquires of the Lord. He says, shall I pursue after this troop? Shall I overcome them? And he answered, pursue. For thou surely shalt overtake them and without fail recover all. Well, now we're going to pick up as they head off to try to track down these Amalekites. In the 11th verse, as they're going, um, in verse 10, rather, it says, David pursued he and the 400 men for 200 abode behind, which were so faint that they could not go over the, the brook Besor. And they found an Egyptian in the field. And they brought him to David and gave him bread, and he did eat. And that typical of our subject, um, the Amalekites, they take a man of the world. Egypt speaks of the world. It'd be nice to take that up as a subject sometime because all the various times that we read about Egypt, it's a picture of the world. So here in our chapter, here's this Egyptian. He's a man of the world and he's a servant to the Amalekite. You know, anybody that serves the flesh, they can do it for so long. And what does the Amalekite do? What does the flesh do with us? It says here, it says that in the 12th verse, they gave him a, a cake of figs, two clusters of raisins. When he had eaten, the spirit came again to him, for he did eat no bread or drink any water three days and three nights. And David said unto him, to whom belongest thou? And whence art thou? And he said, I'm a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite. You know, when we serve the flesh, it's a hard, hard, hard master every time so he goes on he says we made an invasion upon the south of the cherethites upon the uh well actually let's back up in the 13th verse he says I, i'm a servant to an amalekite and my master left me because three days ago i fell sick and that's what the flesh does takes a man of the world uses them for whatever as soon as he's done leaves them done every time and here's the man and david comes along Gives them something to eat. Fourteen first, we made an invasion upon the south of the Cherethites and upon the coast which belongs to Judah and upon the south of Caleb, and we burn Ziklag with fire. He goes through the whole nine yards here. Well, for time's sake, the seventeenth verse it says, and David smote them from the twilight, even unto the evening of the next day, and there escaped not a man of them, save four hundred young men which rode upon camels and fled. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And David rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil nor anything that they had taken to them. David recovered all. To me, the most beautiful thing about this is here's this young man. He's a servant to the Amalekite. It didn't go well. And he ended up being a servant to David. Oh, the flesh. What a hard, hard master the flesh is let's look at the fourth one now we flip over to second samuel second samuel the first chapter this takes place um saul slain on the battlefield as well as his sons which is is where the the second book of samuel takes off and we'll start there came to pass after the death of saul when david was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, David abode two days. Came to pass in the third day, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes rent, earth upon his head. When he came to David, he fell to the earth and did obeisance. And David said to him, from whence comest thou? He said to him, out of the camp of, the, of Israel am I escaped. And David said unto him, how went the matter? I pray thee, tell me. And he answered, the people are fled from battle, and many of the people are fallen and dead. And Saul and Jonathan, uh, his son, are dead also. And David said unto the young man that told him, how knowest thou that Saul and Jonathan, his son, be dead? David wants to know the true story here. And what's happening is he's getting this story from an Amalekite. 
And the man says, here in the sixth verse, the young man that told him said, as I happened by chance upon Mount Gilboa. To me, that's an incredibly <laughs> ridiculous statement. Here he's, Mount Gilboa was the scene of a raging battle. And this man says to David, oh, I was going for a walk and I just happened upon this, uh, I, I just happened to, by chance to, to come across this. Like, are you kidding me? And what that does, it, it alerts David to know something is askew. Something is askew. So, so it says, and he said, and he looked behind him and he saw me and he called unto me and I answered and said, here am I. And he said unto me, who art thou? I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. He said unto me again, stand, I pray thee up, upon me and slay me for anguish has come upon me. Because This is the story that the Amalekites, this is not the true story. We get the true story as to what Saul did by the spirit of God. This is not the spirit of God telling us what happens. This is the spirit of God telling us the story of the Amalekites. And he said, I stood upon him and slew him because I was sure that he could not live after that he was fallen. And I took the crown that was from his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them hither to my Lord. That part was true because he had them in his hand. But Saul had killed himself. And David took hold on his clothes and rent them. Likewise, all the men that were with him and they mourned and wept, fasted until even for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel, because they were fallen by the sword. And David said unto the young man that told him, David's, he's, he's really uneasy about this story. So he says to him, whence art thou? What are your roots? Where, where'd you come from? And the answer is, he says, I am the son of a stranger, an Amalekite. And you know, that just opens things up for David. Just like you can just picture David saying, ah, oh, I understand what's happening now. This is nothing but a fabrication. Turn with me just to get the picture to Genesis 36. Genesis chapter 36, we could have started here because this is the start of Amalek. Genesis 36. In this chapter, we have the generations of Esau. And you could go through them at your leisure through this. Some of these, um, some of these, uh, these lists of names um, are hard for people. I find, them, I find them fascinating. I always go through them because there's always those little things in there that you pick up. So here in verse 12, it says, And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son, and she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. This is where he comes from. And these are the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. And, you know, that, that, that just that, that opens everything up for David. And, you know, if we were to turn, you know, why don't we do it? Um, we have to go to Hebrews 12, where we pick up on, on Esau. Now, turn with me there. I know there's lots of turning here, but just to get the scope of the, of the, uh, the subject, uh, I think it's helpful. Uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. We pick up on, on Esau in the 15th verse, Hebrews 12. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. And you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Esau was in a position where he despised his birthright. He had no appreciation whatsoever for the inheritance. And that was his roots. And David was, was, was pursuing this young man to find out just what his roots were. And um, it came out. He said, I'm a servant to an Amalekite. And David recognized this story was a fabrication. And the young man lost his life because of it. Solemn, solemn thing. So let's, let's go over now to, um, to uh, the next portion. I'm having to skip some here for time. But the fifth one in 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 4. 
First Chronicles chapter four, we pick up again uh, another event with regards to the Amalekites. And it has to do, these early chapters of, of Chronicles have to take up with the posterity of the 12 tribes. A fascinating subject to me, may not be to some, but it is to me. And here we pick up in this chapter, the posterity of the Simeonites. It's one of the bright spots of the Simeonites. There's not many, but this one is. And in connection with the Simeonites, in verse 39, it says, They went to the entrance of Gedor, even unto the east side of the valley, to seek pasture for their flocks. And they found fat pasture and good. And the land was wide and quiet and peaceable. And they of Ham had dwelt there of old. And these written by name came in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and smote their tents and the inhabitants that were found there, and destroyed them utterly unto this day. And dwelt in their ruins because there was pasture there for their flocks. And some of them, even the sons of Simeon. Now here's, here's the sons of Simeon, 500 of them. They went to Mount Seir, having for their, their captains, Pelatiah, Neriah, and Rephaiah, and Uziel, the sons of Ishi. And they smote the rest of the Amalekites that were escaped and dwelt there to this day. And I, I, I was thinking, remember going through this years ago and thinking, I wonder why it was that they had such an animosity against the, the Amalekites. Well, the reason was the work of the Amalekites, as I said earlier, was not to slaughter the people of God, is they took all the food. They took everything there was to eat time and time again. And here, the Simeonites have this pasture and here's the Amalekites on the horizon and they realize they're going to take that too, because that's what they do. They're not going to kill us. And so they go after them and they smite the Amalekites. You know, this all fits. You take, take it all together when I'm done and put it all together for your own meditation and, and see all these pieces, and how they fit together so, so marvelously. And we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at uh, the New Testament in a couple of minutes, just to see the practical application of these matters in our own lives. So the last one I want to look at is in the book of Esther. Wow. Book of Esther. Don't typically think of the Amalekites being in the book of Esther, but they're there loud and clear. The book of Esther. To me, it's fascinating um, this story of Esther, and you, you, you all know it better than I do, so I don't have to tell the story. Uh, but there, there are two figures here that I want to zero in on. One is, um, uh, let me find out where it is. Let's see here. Uh, chapter 2. And the fifth verse. So Esther chapter 2 and verse 5. Now in, Sh in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai. Very prominent figure in the book of Esther. But notice his roots. Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Just like Saul was the son of Kish, so Mordecai was also the son of Kish. Now turn over to the third chapter, where we find another figure that's very prominent in the book of Esther, and it's right in the first verse. After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. He's a descendant of Agag, an Amalekite. To me, it's been so instructive that Saul didn't destroy the Amalekites. So the Lord raised up one from that same family, Mordecai, to destroy the very descendant of Agag, the Amalekite. Isn't that fascinating? It's, to, to, me, it's, to, me, to me, it's beautiful to see these little touches uh, as you go through this subject. But now, come over now to, um, to uh, the seventh chapter, where... Um, we pick up on the end of, of Haman, this Amalekite. So they hanged, uh, chapter 7 and verse 10. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai 
And then was the king's wrath pacified. So that is the end of, of, um, of Haman. But the rest of the chapter, there is, it's just beautiful what, trans, what transpires in the rest of the chapter. Notice in verse 17 of chapter 8. Verse 16, rather. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. Why? Because their enemies were defeated. And it says, in every, in every province, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast, and a good day. I love that statement. A good day. Look over in, in chapter 9 and verse 19. Therefore, the Jews of the villages that dwelt in the unveiled towns made the 14th day, the day of the month, Azar, a day of gladness and feasting and a good day. Look over in the 22nd verse of chapter 9. As the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and in the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy, from mourning into a good day. And you and I both know, we all know, that when the flesh is put in the place of death, it's a good day for every one of us. That is a good day for every one of us when the flesh is put in the place of death. So now let's, let's go now to, um, to the New Testament and just pick up and see where we're at here. Oh, I still got a few minutes. Uh, so we'll pick up in, in the book of, um, well, let's go to Romans 8 first. Romans 8. Because um, th these principles come out in Romans 8, in, in the book of Romans, so loud and clear and it's, um, we can't go through the first um, 10 chapters of the book of Romans, but we can at least touch in on the eighth chapter here where we find a change. And that change is in the first verse, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life is Christ in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now, there's a difference, as we know, in the book of Romans, there's a difference between sin and sins. And as I said earlier, sins are forgiven. Sin is not. It's condemned, the root. And here we find the flesh. It's that which works within us. As I said earlier, the enemy of our souls, he works from without. The world works from without. The flesh works from within. The horrific flesh. Turn over now to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Let's pick up on the 19th verse. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, variance is kind of contention, emulation, that's jealousy, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, all those things that come from within. Yeah, the enemy works so that they, they produce the fruits from without in many of them. But they start there within. It's the works of the flesh. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, let's flip the page. What a beautiful fresh, a breath of fresh air is when we turn this page and we look at the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
Against such, there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. There it is, putting it in the place of death. Just like Agag, Agag was hewed in pieces. Just like the children of Israel were victorious in Exodus 17. Just like that, that, um, that young man lost his life. Uh, at David's hand. Just like the Amalekites were destroyed in Chronicles and also in Samuel. Just like Haman was destroyed. And they just didn't destroy Haman. They destroyed his ten sons too. And we never read of the Amalekite after that. Done. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, what a subject. It seems like it's a horrific subject to take up the subject of the flesh, but what a bright spot to be able to recognize that in our lives, when we start to lose an appetite, it's Amalek taking the food. That's what it is. It's the flesh rearing its ugly head. It's us perhaps looking and saying, you know, I've been obedient 99% of the time. And Lord said, oh, what about that other 1%? Which shows that the bottom line is I'm being disobedient. You know, when my children were small um, and they came to me with half obedience, like I was not impressed. And as I said earlier, that partial obedience is disobedience. But what a lovely thing when we walk in the power of the Spirit of God and have such an appreciation for the food that is so good and real. The, you know, the, the enemy of our souls, he's got a whole buffet banquet for us to feed from. And it's going to take away our appetite for that which is real. Well... May the Lord bless his word with regards to this subject. And, uh, and uh, let's just 